Now back to the uh, topic we're talking about, World War II. Italy. Um, Italy at this time is a sort of fascism. Uh, and the leader of it was Mussolini. Now, when I was in high school, some of us would call him Mussolini. Um, and if I slip up and do that, you understand it's uh, somewhat of a habit. Uh, I did a speech on him in, in high school. I also did one on Hitler. Uh, you might wonder what was my fascination with those men. Well, I may have told this class out. I once noticed my oldest daughter looking up men like Jesse James, Pretty Boy Floyd, Bonnie and Clyde, Babyface Nelson. Any of you know anything about these people? You do? They were all very, very bad characters. If you go ahead. Look on. I enjoy researching men like that myself. Not that I want to copy them. I tend not to. But uh, anyway, I've done some research on men like this. And uh, now your book shows a picture there on page 727. My dad said that when he was a young man, he used to work at these factories in western Pennsylvania, steel mills. And the Italians, this is before Mussolini became known for being such a bad man, but the Italians would just pride themselves and they're waving like this. And they were really proud of that Italian dictator or uh, look really stiff and proud and poker stiff. But again, trying to copy their hero, Mussolini, um, who was like their hero at the time. Unlike Hitler, Mussolini took over in 1922, very early. Actually, you might say he took over as a result of the turmoil in Italy from the depression of the early 20s, what we sometimes call the Forgotten Depression. And he tried to set up a totalitarian state in Italy. Now, you may notice I said he tried to. Your book emphasizes he never was able to quite get the control that Hitler and Stalin had. The Catholic Church remained independent. The monarchy remained independent. But he tried to convince the people that he was it. Mussolini is always right. It was a plastered all over Italy. And uh, he tried to set himself up as something of a god. But he never really had the control. Now, um, when he took over, there was a whole lot of chaos in Italy. The veterans returning from the wars found they had no jobs. So they went around and plundered. And they weren't afraid of anything. I mean, after all, they were combat-hardened veterans. So to get these people busy, he um, uh, basically he sent all the women home. Told the women, you go home. And uh, Hitler did the same thing. You bear children. The, the women were allowed to do certain jobs like uh, civil service, jobs that wouldn't strain them and would, might make them more likely to bear healthy children. But he didn't want them to do stressful jobs like school teaching. Yeah, he considered teaching to be a stressful job. Um, social work, yes. Teaching, no. Factory work, no. He knew, he knew the factory work might get heavy. And the heavy work might prevent women from, from bearing children. The idea was, was to have a big population explosion in Italy, to have, make Italy have a lot of people so they could field large armies. His dream was to reconquer, re basically rebuild the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire fell in the 400s. And ever since then, a lot of people in Europe have dreamed of rebuilding it. Not just the Catholic Church. Yeah, the Catholic Church has tried to rebuild it. The uh, Mussolini tried to rebuild it. But they tried to rebuild that empire. But it has never been restored. But he had dreams that he was going to conquer the whole Mediterranean, even as Roman as had been done in Roman times. Um, but he never quite, never quite got uh, the control that uh, he wanted. Never quite got the control that he would find in Russia, or in um, in the Soviet Union, is or in Germany. He had a bunch of people go around 
We had brown shirts, they were called brown shirts, to try to set up a police state. Now, Hitler did this extremely well, and so did Stalin. The police state meant that nobody knew ex always who the policemen were. You might go to a party and get a little bit drunk and make a remark like Hitler's a nut. The next thing you know, you'd disappear. You'd get a knock on your door at midnight and uh, your neighbors would not see you again. Uh, that was the police state in Germany. The police state also in the Soviet Union. Um, and nobody knew who they could trust. Mussolini was never quite able to get that set up in his uh, country. Now, in fact, Mussolini had dreams of building up the army, but his attempts to build up the army were always coming up short. And he once told his buddy, Adolf Hitler, hey, Italy won't be ready for war until 1943. Can you please put it off? Hitler, who felt like he didn't have that long to wait, plunged in and went to war anyway. To give you some idea, your book doesn't mention this, but give you some idea of what the rest of the world thought of Italy and Mussolini. When there was a civil war in Spain in the 1930s, Franco was set up, looked like he was going to be defeated. Franco was on the side of the uh, totalitarians against the democracy. Well, Britain and France did not help the democracy side, but uh, Italy and Germany wound up sending troops to aid Franco. But Britain and France said to each other, well, Italy was on our side in the last war, but let's go ahead and let Italy join with Germany this time because Italy will do us more good on Hitler's side than, they will, than Italy will on our side. So uh, they allowed Mussolini to, in fact, encourage Mussolini to side with Franco and Hitler. Um, realizing that he would be a serious liability to any side he was on, and this was true. Mussolini contributed greatly to Germany losing the war. In fact, Hitler should have at one point said to him, well, hey, you've got yourself in this mess, I'm not going to bail you out. I mean, we'll talk more about that later. But uh, Mussolini's armies got clobbered by the Greeks, and Hitler went down to bail him out, and it wound up helping to cost him the war. All right. So much for Mussolini for the time being. Now moving on to uh, Germany. The party was the Nazi party. The leader, of course, was Hitler. Um, I do want to go into a little bit of detail about Hitler's personal life. Hitler, uh, as a youngster, was sent to a school like the other youngsters of his age, and he made above average grades. So his father had really high plans for him. He was going to try to make something of him. Unfortunately, his father died young, so died when Hitler was young, that is. Um, interestingly enough, the class yesterday is the first class I had where it seemed like nobody had heard this, but I'm going to ask you, have any of you heard that Adolf Hitler might have been part Jewish. Okay, several, okay, several hands have gone up. Yeah, somehow that class yesterday didn't seem to know that. All right, yeah, we don't know exactly, but his father, his father's mother had been a secretary to the extremely wealthy Rothschild, Rothschild firm. And the Rothschilds were Jewish, but they were, they were so wealthy that the Kaiser, on more than one occasion, came to visit them to have lunch with them. I mean, the Kaiser came to their house, if you understand, not them going to the Kaiser's palace. Uh, but uh, they, they were just extremely, extremely wealthy. And uh, Adolf Hitler's father um, is believed, possibly, his father was one of the Rothschilds. And the Rothschild family may have been instrumental in putting Hitler forward, thinking they could control him, only to find out once they got him in that he was a monster that they couldn't control, that he actually had a mind of his own. Um, but this story has been told, that he's, he might have been part Jewish. You can't prove it. Anyway, Hitler grew up. He went around doing odd jobs, trying to find his place in the world. He um, tried his look at painting. 
became an artist. His artwork still survives to this day, but his artwork has one serious problem. In addition to being overall amateurish, his artwork was uninhabited. That is, he could not draw the human figure. He chose streets, avenues, buildings, city scenes, landscape scenes, but no people inside him. Again, he uh, was, he simply did not have the ability to draw the human figure. But later he called himself the Supreme Art Critic. When the war broke out, he joined the army and somehow survived, even though he was given the most dangerous of jobs, <clears throat> and then he, he survived. But something else that was really conspicuous about his army life in those days, in the Austrian army, if you survived a battle, you were given an automatic promotion and told to lead the new troops who were just coming in from, from basic training, you might say. But he survived battle after battle after battle for four years and never got a promotion. Apparently, his superiors did not think he was a good leader of men. Anyone else would have gotten a promotion. In fact, probably anyone else would have gotten to the rank of captain by uh, after four years of surviving one battle after another. He never did. Late in the war, though, he uh, was uh, touched by some gas and blinded. He spent either a year or two in a hospital, then he eventually recovered his eyesight and partially recovered. It is believed by some that he was what you call shell-shocked. Um, and that's a more or less permanent mental condition that a lot of combat veterans receive. And uh, some people look on it as being a sign of weakness, but others say that anybody, if, some, if they go through enough hardship, will become shell-shocked if, uh, if they are battered enough. Anyway, he, he might have been, because he saw a lot of the horrors of the war. Anyway, the war over, he recovered. He went to Germany, where he said his heart had always been, because he considered himself German. He was born in Austria and grew up in Austria. But he considered himself Germany, so he crossed in Germany. Then one day he was given a special assignment to go examine a group called the German Workers' Party. The German Workers' Party at the time consisted of only seven men. But some of the officers in Germany suspected they might be subversive. So Hitler went and examined them, reported back that hey, there was nothing wrong with them, except that while he was there, he became really enamored with their ideas and decided, hey, I ought to join up with this group. He walked forward join in short order he became their leader and the party grew they began recruiting they began to call themselves Nazi which is short for National Socialist by the way the S in fascism stands for socialist um, the Z in Nazi here stands for socialist um, which the Soviet Union was socialist socialism was making a lot of headway in Europe even though I must say that fast forward to 2014, Europe is much more socialist today than it was while Hitler was alive. Now, in 1923, November of 23, he uh, got, well, I don't worry about the date so much, but he got together an attempt to take over the government, the beer hall punch. Now, basically, he got together an army with himself as a leader for the first time in his life. I mean, he, this man had been decorated twice for bravery during World War I. All right, but he was leading this army that was going to march on the German capital and take over the German government. He expected to have an easy time of it, but the defenders fired a volley of shots, basically warning shots, and Hitler was the first man to hit the dirt. Then the first man to get up, turn around, and run pell-mell from the scene. Now, if you're in a combat situation, and all of a sudden your commanding officer takes off running pell-mell from the battlefield, guess what the ordinary troops all wind up doing? This has happened several, even in American history. General Gage, the hero of Saratoga, ran a smaller British army one time, but he got spooked, that is our American General Gage, got spooked and ran. And when he did, the entire American army ran with him. 
King Edward was once fighting the Scots and he got spooked and he took off. He had twice as many men as the Scottish did. All of a sudden he got spooked and took off running. When he did, his entire army ran and he had to sign a paper giving Scotland their independence. In the case of Hitler, he took off running and of course, actually, naturally, the entire group took off running also. I won't call them an army, I'll call them a group. And Hitler was put in prison. He spent a short time in prison. He was very popular at this time, and the courts knew this, so during his trial, he was allowed to interrupt as often as he pleased. And to show you what kind of man he was, at one point he said to the judge, that, hey, you're judging me, and I know you're going to find me and my group guilty, but we are actually being judged by the eternal court of history. She will smile on us because she, that is the eternal court of history, she is on our side. She acquits us, though I know you will. Um, you will uh, condemn us. Hitler was given a short jail, a short time in prison. During his stay in prison, he wrote a book called Mine. Mein Kampf. And in his book, he told the world what he intended to do. And people should have paid more attention to it. That's K-A-M-P-H for those of you who have a hard time copying. Mein Kampf. Um, again, he told the world what he planned to do, and he told the world about his anti-Semitism. But the book was 700 pages long, and it was not interesting reading. In fact, it has been said that when Hitler ruled Germany, every German family felt compelled to have it in their home, and they put it on a dinner table in a prominent place because it just looked good in case an SS person came around. They wanted to see it, but most Germans even never read its more than 700 uh, monotonous pages. But nevertheless, he at least put down what he intended to do. He got out of the out of prison, then. I think I ought to tell this, give you some idea what kind of man he was. He fell madly in love with his niece, who was half his age. He was 38 and she was 19. His niece, to get away from him, committed suicide. And Hitler almost committed suicide himself that night. So at least one of his friends had to stay with him for a few days to make sure he didn't. He was very torn up about it. And nevertheless, he recovered. But the prosperous 20s were lean years for Hitler. The membership in his party declined. People paid little attention. I mean, they went about their business. A man like him can only prosper when times are bad. When times are good, you might compare him to a fly. Flies only abound where there's filth, garbage. Take all the filth away and the flies have to fly away because they can't find anything to thrive on. Everything went bad for him, it seemed, until the stock market crash in America in 1929. October 1929, a big stock market crash occurred, and the, people, the American investors began pulling their money out of Germany in by the bucketfuls, you might say, and German currency became utterly worthless. It took a whole wheelbarrow full of German marks to buy a loaf of bread. And um, at this time, the German people began starving. Un unemployment was really high. Banks were foreclosing on the mortgages. And everybody was uh, really having, even the rich people were having a hard time. Hitler found this time to be his opportunity. And his, his party began to grow in numbers. He was able to stand in front of the crowd and in effect say, I have the solution to your problems. I know what can be done to fix this nation. He gave the people a certain amount of hope and a lot of the people listened. 